Yeah, is this about right? I'm Christine Olson. I'm a member of the board of the Young Association of Western Mass. Um, I want to, uh, I just have a few announcements. Thank you all for donating um, in, in our contribution basket as you come in. Much appreciated. And what we take in at the door allows us to host this lecture series and other community programs. Please connect with us um, through email and Facebook. We have an email sign-up list to receive a monthly announcement of our lecture series. Um, and I want to acknowledge Diana Allen for um, taking on a volunteer job to keep our Facebook page updated. Where is Diana? Diana, raise your hand. Thank you. So check out our Facebook page. It's got new content on it all the time. Please help us connect with others by posting flyers. Um, but each coming lecture, we put out a new flyer. So any place you go that has a bulletin board, we appreciate you taking a flyer and posting it up. Um, we know people come from wide, a wide range of places, so it's great if you could just help us spread the word. We have a new videographer. I want to acknowledge Sky Karen. Where is Sky? Thank you, Sky, for sharing your professional skills with us. Please speak with her if you're interested in her services. And remember, um, you may ask to have the video turned off if you're asking a question during a discussion period, which you would not like to have um, on a video that might be, other, the public might be seeing it. Tonight we're starting a lending library um, in a, a small way with two copies of Penny Teresek's new book. Uh, called Polishing the Stones. See me afterward if you'd like to sign out one or two copies. He's a board, board member. <laughs> um, as usual, uh, oh, the salon. Uh, we also have a new thing happening with the salon tonight. It turned out Mosaic uh, changed their hours on Friday night. So we're going to try meeting uh, at the campus center. They have a cafe there, and it's directly across the green. So it's a nice, easy walk. Um, to that cafe. We'll meet there for discussion and getting to know each other in a more personal way. Um, everyone is welcome to the salon. And please see Carol Bovet if you want to walk over with someone. Carol? Stand up. Carol, stand up. Because stand up. everybody might not know how to get there or exactly where the cafe is. So. Hi. It's a good brisk walk. Good brisk. It'll wet you <laughs> up after the salon and it's good energy for a discussion of those things that were on your mind that you didn't say while you were here. As usual, please silence your cell phones. There's no bathroom break, um, but there are bathrooms in this hall, outside in the hall beyond, and also downstairs. Um, Penny Teresek is will be our next lecturer, and this flyer has to do with her uh, lecture and I think drawing on your new book. Ah, okay. Penny is a local analyst, artist, and author. And um, in addition to hearing her next month, she will be introducing our speaker tonight, Erica Lorenz. Good evening. I'm so impressed that you come out on these cold days and nights. It's really impressive. So. I'm hoping that it nourishes your body and soul to be here. Let me introduce Erica Lorenz. She loves the body, movement, psyche, and imagination. She started doing active imagination and authentic movement in 1975 with Janet Adler here in Western Massachusetts. She trained as a Jungian analyst through the IRS, which is the Interregional Society, and became an analyst in 1998 while living and teaching in Houston, Texas. She moved back to the East Coast approximately 2010 and to the Valley in 2011. She is a training analyst at the C.G. Jung Institute in Boston, and she served on the training board for a number of years. 
Since 1986, she has been lecturing and teaching workshops in the United States and Canada. For the past five years, she's been president of the Young Association of Western Massachusetts, this group. She is an extraordinarily hardworking person and believes in building community, and I really do see that that's happening. And I'm so glad you can be a part of it. Erica and I have become very good friends these past three years in particular, and she is dedicated to Jung's work and immersed in the meaning, in meaning and symbols, especially active imagination. Erica is a depth psychologist and a philosopher, in the true sense of the word, the love of wisdom. She knows the work of Nietzsche, and she's truly dedicated in helping humans individuate. Erica is one of the rare souls who has a brilliant mind and understands the <coughs> essence and importance of the embodiment. She brings theory into our bodies. Thank you, Erica. And she and I regularly share deep conversations about the evolution of humanity, the psyche, and the cosmos, eat good food, and we're on the threshold of sharing adventures. So, Erica. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you, Penny. Oh, I just turned mine on. Is it on yet? No. no. It's on. Is it on? Yeah. There we go. Okay. I just want to let you know that any <coughs> clinical material I use tonight, I've gotten permission from people. I don't do do something like this unless I have permission. Um, as you can see, <coughs> Einstein grew up to be a, a quite amazing man, besides being one of the most renowned physicists in the world, and he believed very much in imagination. Imagination is everything. It's the preview of life's coming attractions. Imagination is more important than knowledge, for knowledge is limited to all we know and understand, while imagination embraces the entire world and all there ever will be to know and understand. So I always start my lectures by talking about the crisis that we're in, the modern crisis, the modern crisis of our mankind, humanity, and the world and the planet. We have become alienated from our soul. And Jung's um, experience in his, in, that's written in the Red Book and his which was the Rosetta Stone for all of the rest of his writings. Because what he was trying to do from his initial experiences was to understand what this meant and how it related to archetypal reality and our spirituality and our psychology, and then how to put that to use and help other people. So, um, <coughs> so we have become split. We have become split, like the split man, the, the world's wound, um, painted by uh, Peter Verkhauser, and we'll get there in a little while. We have lost our connection to instinct, we have lost our connection to the body, we have lost, we have split the body, mind, and brain, I might say, and we have lost our community and our spiritual life in many ways. So this lecture hopefully will bring some, some the ways Jung reconnected with that and how we can reconnect with it. <coughs> so in The Master and His Emissary, written by Ian McGilchrist, has anybody read it? It's quite an amazing 800 pages. He, he was a brain research scientist, and I don't really believe in brain research because there's so much more than the brain. But I like the way he he decided, he developed and did research on the left and the right hemisphere. Um, and I don't think it's exactly like this, but, and this goes really with Jung's uh, non-directed thinking that goes with the right brain and directed thinking, which goes with the left brain. 
or, or I think they're calling it sort of the associative brain and the control brain now. There's some issues, some, that's the way they're working with it. <coughs> so the right brain comes online first. It, within the first, and it's dominant the first 18 months, it's connected with the brain stem, which is the oldest, most primitive part of the brain, brain, and the limbic system, which has to do with our emotions. It's, it connects with empathy, social connection, and intersubjectivity. It processes emotions, particularly sadness. Bodily experiences, whole body image, and the neuroendocrine inter interface. It, it, relates to implicit nonverbal communication, and it connects to context, relationship, gestalt, the complex issues, and the holistic view. And it can hold ambiguous possibilities without interpretation, which is what you have to do as an analyst, and hopefully as a person. It loves paradox, <laughs> it mediates the unconscious, and it sees things in long time periods. It prefers novelty, uncertainty, and the symbolic, and it loves individual uniqueness. Now, the, this should be the master. The right brain should be the master. But we have switched it in our evolution and our education and the way we work. So the left brain develops after the right. It's, it's a sense of separate, it has self-needs and detachment. The left brain is very important. We couldn't do what we do without both parts of the brain, so neither is bad. We've just gotten unbalanced. It sets aspects aside, it denial splits the body and mind, and I think he said that it, uh, the emotion that's sort of connected with the left brain is anger. Um, I think. It has explicit, describable language, it's direct focused attention, it analyzes, organizes, categorizes, and hierarchy. It abstracts, conceptualizes, manipulates to bring control and resolution, has fixed ideas that are known, discernible, it wants to know, it wants to discern, it wants it to be discreet, it's literal, and it's local attention. And it can't comprehend outside its known explicit worldview. That's very interesting, a little bit scary. So I think in our scientific rationalism, we have we sort of end up here. You know, we can't go beyond that in many ways. What was his name? Ian McGilchrist. When so, was this written? What? When was this written? Um, I'm not sure when the book was written. A long time ago. No, not, too, not long, long. Have That's you read it? Do you remember? I have to look out my library. Yeah, yeah. I think it was written this half. No, it's a little longer than that, but it's not like in the 40s or 50s. It's, it's, it's in the last 10, 20 years, 15 maybe. Yeah. I'll look it up. Yeah, thank I'll you. I'll look it up. There you go. <laughs> okay. Okay, so this way of thinking, this way of working, um, this way of being educated, Jung says, usually the conscious is characterized by an intensity and a narrowness, which has a cramping effect. Everything must be done to help the unconscious to reach. 2009. To not 2009. It was the master and the emissary, right? Yeah. Yeah, 2009. Yeah. Everything <coughs> must be done to help the unconscious to reach the conscious mind and free it of its rigidity in order to reconnect with soul, in order to reconnect with the imaginal realm. There's a book by Eric Neumann, who's a classical Jungian, who was a um, student and colleague of Jung's, Eric Neumann from Israel, um, who's, who wrote The History and Development of Consciousness, which is a, another very thick book, <laughs> and Anne Baring, which just came into my awareness not too long ago, wrote a book called The Dream of the Cosmos, where she sort of talked, she talks basically about the same thing. And what they're saying, which isn't new for many of us, is that um, first there was matriarchy, and the goddess was supreme, and the masculine was um, under the goddess. And then, 30,000 years ago, um, then the patriarchy began, and we became, under, we became more and more um, agriculture, industrial, so on, scientific <coughs> um, rationalism. And what Jung was saying was that, okay, we've gone through those important developmental stages of having the 
the right brain sort of developed, and then the left brain developed. And now what we need is a union. We need the conjunctio, not one or the other. We need the conjunctio. And we need to get back to our roots. In uh, Excalibur, which is a very gothic version of, of the King Arthur story, it's a movie. I love it. <laughs> um, Merlin says he, he's, he teaches Arthur, and then he's going to be seduced back into the cave by Morrigan, the, the witch goddess person. And he knows this is going to happen. And he says to Arthur, he said, it is the time of man. He's kind of distraught. <laughs> and then later, he goes and, and gets enchanted in the cave. And later on the last battlefield that Arthur has, Arthur conjures him up for help. And Merlin arrives, and Arthur's kind of surprised to see him. And Merlin said, to some, I'm a dream. To others, I'm a nightmare. Okay. We'll come back to Merlin. So Jung's answer to our modern crisis is to come back to the unconscious, to come back and reconnect with soul, the instinct, the feminine. The feminine has very much been lost. I'm not sure our culture, I'm not sure modern people know what a healthy feminine or masculine is in many ways. Um, and to, to reconnect through fantasy and play. Fantasy and play. When Jung first started on his journey, he went down to the lake in his backyard to Lake Zurich, and he's picked up little stones and pebbles, and he recreated his original home, town. And through that, he began to have memories of his childhood. He did his own amnesis of his own journey and his own childhood and what his issues were. And, um, and that was the beginning of the journey that took him into the Red Book, the Black Books, which turned <coughs> into the Red Books. So we need to enter by this way. We enter into a relationship with the unconscious. And every, if anybody has brought up children, you know that, or worked with children, you know that children play. And their play is very serious. It can be very playful and imaginative and funny and stuff, but it's also very serious. I had a, um, George's granddaughter was with us a couple months ago at our, my house, and, and in, the, in the small bedroom there was a sort of a crib playpen, and her mother is pregnant. And there was a bed in there, and she wanted to, me to get her in the playpen, and then she, well, she told me to get on the bed, and we were supposed to go to sleep. <laughs> and then she would wake up, and I was supposed to wake up, and I was supposed to go give her a hug, and, and then we were all supposed to go back to sleep again. We went over, and we must have done this for a half an hour. <laughs> and what do you think she was working on? Her mother was going to have a baby, and she was being the baby. Okay, she's done some other things, too, which have been very interesting. So this was a very important um, process for her, though it was very playful. So we want to get back to the soul. What is the soul? The soul is being that has soul is living being. That, that, this is Jung, all Jung. That which lives of itself and causes life. She makes us to believe incredible things that life may be lived. To have soul is the whole adventure of life. It's the, she is the seat of all psychic suffering and the dwelling place of all healing truths. She is the subtle body, the breath body, something non-material and finer than air. She favors everything bodily, sensuous, emotional, physiological, the unconscious, the somatic unconscious, the physiological unconscious and the somatic unconscious. The body is merely, this is one of my favorite quotes, the body is merely the visibility of the soul, the psyche, and the soul is the psychological experience of the body. So it is really one and the, main, one and the same thing. Oh, I misspelled that, sorry about that. And Heraclitus said, you could not discover the limits of the soul even if you traveled by every path in order to do so. So profound is its meaning. That's pretty big. OK. So what is fantasy, then? Fantasy is the maternally creative side of the masculine mind, the maternally creative side. We can never rise above fantasy. 
Fantasy does not easily go astray. It is too deep for that, and too closely bound up with the taproot of human and animal instinct. The creative activity of imagination frees us from our bondage of the nothing but and raises us to the status of one who plays. My aim, this is Jung talking, is to bring about a psychic state in which my patient plays, in which my patient begins to experiment with his own nature, a state of fluidity, change, and growth where nothing is eternally fixed and hopelessly petrified. That sounds like the right brain, doesn't it? Okay, so let's talk about some examples. The <coughs> alchemists. Jung, when Jung discovered the alchemist by synchronicity, and von Franz, Marie-Louise von Franz, helped him to translate many things and helped him to write his book, they were collaborated, um, he realized that the, system, the symbolic system of alchemy is an act of imagination, and it's one of the most complete systems of, of symbolism that really shows many, many different ways and layers and, and operations that we go through in the process of transformation. And what the alchemists were doing is they weren't making gold. gold. That was a false alchemist. The true alchemist was making the philosopher's stone. They were, they were finding their true nature. They were, make, they were making a spiritual connection. I did a thing on a three-hour thing on alchemy about two, three years ago, and I'll have to do it again sometime. <laughs> so that's what Jung discovered, and, and he wrote three books on alchemy, I think. And so this is the Solar Splenda series. It has many different pictures that I'm going to show you tonight. And everything in this picture has a meaning. Everything is a symbol. The colors, the birds, the flowers, the butterflies, the children, where people are placed. Um, everything is symbolic. But I'm going to run through five of them <laughs> and just give you the highlights because we could spend hours on each one of these. There's a wonderful book called um, by Joe Henderson called, I forget, but it, it has this whole series in it. And he, trans he uh, interprets it all. So I just wanted to show this one because it's about play. The children are playing. And red, blue, and uh, yellow are very important alchemical symbols. And you have the blackbird <coughs> up here, and you have the mother with the infant and the older ch child helping. And then there's the alembics, the alchemical vessels on top of the mantle in the back. And um, that sort of looks like an uh, uh, alchemical furnace. Pointer in here. Do. It works. <coughs> Not working. Oh well. Okay. Um, so it looks like an alchemical furnace back there, and then there's a secret passageway. So this is about the play of the symbols <coughs> and the alchemy and the soul. Here we're looking for the treasure, and there's a whole story at, at the bottom. Um, and we're digging. We're looking for the treasure under the, under the, and the, the, you have the sun and the clouds and the, and here's the moon, the alchemical moon in the, in the water. And uh, so that's the treasure, <coughs> looking for the so treasure. Erica? Yeah. Um, was it the alchemist that created these yeah. pictures? Yes. This was an, al an alchemist who, who painted these pictures. Yeah. So here we have a purification, solucio, a purification that, that the alchemists, the adept, now there were female alchemists too, not just male alchemists. Uh, yes, sir? What? Uh, no thanks. So, so here we have the alchemist being purified, and on the top is a dove, which is a symbol of the soul and Aphrodite, but the dove in this picture is not coming down. Dove is go is coming from the alchemist and will ascend, and the, and the when you're working on a transformational process, the the heat has to be right. If it's too hot, if there's too much motion or energy or too much upset, it, you can't cook, and if there's too little, nothing's happening. So you have to you have to make the fire just right. 
and this is the, the death of the king. So it would be the death of the overly, it's interesting, in alchemy, the, the queens don't die, the kings die. So we see the king in the back, in the water, he's drowning. And the sun and, and, and the sun and the star are shining on him and the rain clouds. So the old way of thinking, the old way of being, the old way of viewing the world is, is, is falling apart, is dying. And it needs to die. Every time we come through something, something has died in order for something to be reborn. And here we have the prince. who The, the robe is a little bit big for the prince. We have to grow into the new clothes. And he has the crown and the stars, and the, there's the dove sitting on the, the orb. And this is a kind of a symbol of the um, when we finish a transformational process, and we go through many, 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 many different deaths and rebirths, and we're coming out of the prima materia of the muck, of, the, of all the stuff we've had to deal with and which is black and the red is the final stage the rubedo the rubedo and um and the the white has to do with the purification so we're coming out of the the dark muck and we're met by a beautiful and um celestial being feminine being who gives us the red robe the red robe of the transformation the red robe of the rubedo so that's an example. This, this series had about maybe 20 paintings altogether, and it's really phenomenal. It's, they were one of the most colorful and intricate alchemical pictures I've ever seen. So. Okay. So Nathan Schwartz Salat says, this shift of consciousness can be described as a movement from a solar consciousness that readily leads to interpretations into a lunar consciousness that focuses upon images and imaginal perceptions. Sounds like the right and the left brain. This shift involves an introverted act in which psychic energy, attention and consciousness, is surrendered to the unconscious and to a symbolic sense of oneness, the one continuum. So uh, this introverted act is very important because when we the answer is inside, it's not outside. And we have to go inside, we have to allow ourselves to be still, to be quiet, to listen, to stop being busy all the time. Okay. Um, the Sufis talked about this actually. In fact, um, Jung talks about all spiritual traditions and all mythologies and fairy tales and folk, folk lore uh, in terms of the archetypal level that has to do with these very important psychological changes in ourselves. And the Sufis, according to Henry Corbin, Corbin, said this psychic space, the lunar consciousness, not mind or matter, the Sufis call the mundus imaginalis. And it's an intermediate space of subtle bodies subtle ephemeral bodies. And to us, it's psychic reality. This is psychic reality. The Sufis say the, it's the power of the heart. And the power of the heart is a kind of an eye by which the divine knows itself and receive, reveals itself to itself. That's a beautiful idea. And this to us, it, translate, it translates as active imagination. So what is active imagination? Active imagination is a dialogue between the conscious and the unconscious that we actively participate in. Dreaming is a passive imagination, which we then engage with. But an active imagination, we're awake, we're focused, we're connecting to the unconscious. And uh, it's different. It's not just going off into a story or telling a memory of your childhood or, or something like that. It's really taking an image, an emotion, an, an energetic experience, a smell, uh, an auditory experience, and it's focusing on that, focusing on that and focusing on that until that reveals its secret, 
until it tells us what what it wants us to know, what it wants us to know. And this was Jung's preferred process of work. And it's not about creating art. If, if you're creating art, it's beautiful and it can be active imagination, but the focus is more on the aesthetic quality. This is more on the, the psychological qualities and, and process. So it can be in any form, and I'm going to show you a bunch of different forms. So let's play with this, because I want to show you something that's a little different. So if I have an image of an elephant, tell me what, anybody, just what comes first to your mind when you think of an elephant, when an elephant comes up? Their trunk. Trunk, OK. India. India, OK. Big lights. What? Big lights. Big lights? Legs. Legs, <laughs> OK. Tusks. Tusks. Memory. Memory, OK. Sweetness. Sweetness. What do you think, what comes up when you think of sweetness? What? Candy. Candy, OK. Children. Children, OK. What comes up when you think of children? Playing. Playing. This is what comes up first. It's not a test. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever comes up. Love. Love. Okay. Anything else? Children. Maternal. Maternal. Okay. What comes up when you think of maternal? <coughs> Female. Female. Anything else? Pregnancy. Pregnancy. Lap. Lap. Okay. Notice that we have gotten way far away from the elephant. What happened to the elephant? <laughs> the elephant disappeared. That's Freudian association. You just keep associating to the next thing, which associates. I, ha I have a client that I've worked with for a long time, and she's been trying to work with dreams herself. And she said, Erica, this is crazy. I'm not getting anywhere. I'm like, well, what are you doing? <laughs> she said, I'm just writing pages and pages and pages of associations. I said, well, that's the problem. You're getting away from the dream itself. So Jung's focus was to sit with whatever it is until it becomes alive. And Janet Dallet, um, who is, I'll have a quote with her, um, she has a wonderful book called Listening to the Rhino, which is an amazing story of a woman who had, was dying and she had, a, she had a dream about a rhino and she worked with this rhino for a very long time and she was healed, however that happened. Anyway, so she said, I couldn't, some people this is very easy for and some people it's very hard and she would sit at the typewriter and just wait. Nothing would come up, and nothing would come up, and she couldn't get anywhere. Finally, she said, but this nasty voice would come up and say, what are you doing? So she decided that she was going to listen to the nasty voice and start writing that. And that's when she began to break through and go, oh, this is active imagination. It doesn't matter what I'm focusing on, but it, it speaks to me. And that's the thing about active imagination. You're focusing on an image or a dream or a feeling. And suddenly you go, oh, what was that? Where did that come from? It's surprising. It, it wouldn't, it wouldn't um, coax us unless it wanted to tell us something new or something that we don't quite get yet. We wouldn't dream unless it, a dream tells us about something we're still unconscious about. We're not conscious of it yet, or we wouldn't need to dream it. So the unconscious is constantly bringing up things to help correct <coughs> conscious view of ourselves and give us new life, new new focus, new um, new um, ways of thinking. So Janet Dallas says, active imagination contains the very essence of psychological transformation. The relationship between the conscious and the unconscious is what leads to a new center and synthesis of the personality. So let's. Feel free to jump in and ask a question or whatever as we go along. Any questions so far? Yeah. I just wanted to go back to that alchemy series. Mm -hmm. I wondered where they were made, when they were made, and who would have looked at them? Who would have used um, them? Well, that's a, that's a good question. I think these were made in the 14th century. I'd have to go back and look exactly. I think they're the 1400s. Alchemy started way back in China and Egypt. I mean, it's very old. It actually started. Its roots are in shamanism and and the blacksmith, actually. But, um, um, and the, the alchemists would do the procedures in the laboratory, 
but then they would write in very strange ways, which I think was partly to not get caught by the Inquisition, but partly because they were in depths and partly because they were in another uh, lunar consciousness. Um, and then they would paint, they would draw. So these were, these, the, like I said, everything in those images had a meaning. Every symbol had a meaning. So it was sort of like the alchemist's way of depicting that, of carrying on the act of imagination. To search in search of the philosopher's stone. Excuse me. Yeah. Sure. First mm -hmm. Well, when we were talking about that and Freudism, I remember one of my professors was talking about also like automated thinking, like mm -hmm. the Freudian session. You're mentioning the first thing that comes to mind, even if it might be obscene or whatever. Mm -hmm that visual art, that's surreal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Joe? Uh, yeah, uh, Jung wrote a fascinating introduction to a Chinese alchemical mm -hmm. text called The Secret of the Golden yeah. Flower, which is a very amazing text of how qi energy can deposit itself in a certain way that the bodies are more than psyche, they're actually <laughs> subtle bodies. Subtle bodies, yeah. yes. The Secret of the Golden Flower, the introduction to the Secret of the Golden Flower, which is a Chinese alchemical text that Jung wrote. Uh, yes, thank you. Okay, any other thoughts? Yes. Just one other question. Um, how would you relate this into the transcendent function? The transcendent function, so we're focusing, right? And we're, and we're coming back and forth between our consciousness, which is our active part of it, and the unconscious. And between those two, something is born. Yeah. That's the transcendent function. So right. the, they're only synonymous. Um, well, that it's born that out of the process. process yeah. yeah. So it's the new information, the the prince. Mm -hmm. Okay. The new prince, the new princess, whatever. Yeah. And that helps me see, understand better transcendent. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Any other thoughts? Yeah. Yes. Um. The imagination is so limitless that mm -hmm. we shouldn't put a limit on ours or anybody else's. And yeah. a quote that I came up with is, inspiration yields imagination, which is our invocation to innovation. There you go. You want to say that louder? Mm -hmm. Inspiration yeah. yields imagination, which is our invocation to innovation. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so if we follow that, we'll have all kinds of new ideas and, and experiences. Okay, I'm going to go on a little bit. Um, so Jung had these amazing experiences, and this is Bollingen, but I'm going to tell you a little bit. About. So in 1910, when he 1910, when he broke with Freud because he realized that he was he needed to go on his own way. He didn't he didn't disagree all with Freud, but he felt like it was limited. So he, did, he went through this four or five year very deep journey into the unconscious. And at that point he said, I have to let go of all my theories when I work with people. I have to just come and find a new way. And this, the, not the black books, which was his, were his journals, he made this, the red book, which was a beautiful leather bound book and that he painted in later. And, um, he did this beautiful, the whole thing is in calligraphy. It's just beautiful. Has anybody seen the Red Book? It's just quite phenomenal. And in the beginning of the Red Book, he said, he has a talk with his soul. He says, my soul, where are you? I have returned. Life has led me back to you. I am weary, my soul. My wandering has lasted too long. My search for myself, outside myself. You went invisibly with me, putting the pieces together meaningfully. And you took me where I thought to take hold. Wait. You took me away where I thought to take hold, and you gave me where I did not expect anything. You upheld my belief when I was alone and near despair. At every decisive moment, you let me believe in myself. So this is a, a plea to his soul, and he says, he says, he takes her hand and he says, you have to come with me. I have to be with you on this journey. 
So one of the ways he painted, he wrote a lot. He was brilliant, a genius. He wrote many volumes. And then he said in 1923, words and paper did not seem real enough to me. I, to put my fantasies on solid footing, something more was needed. I had to achieve a kind of repre representation in stone of my innermost thoughts and of the knowledge I had acquired. Put another way, I had to make a confession of faith in stone. That was the beginning of the tower, the big round one is what he built first. The house I built for myself at Bollinger. And so he built the round one first himself all himself. And he says, at Bollingen, I am in the midst of my true life. I am most deeply myself. So he built the round one first, then he built the back, these towers, then he built the courtyard, and he said, the courtyard was open to God and the stars and the air. And then when he, after his wife died, he realized wait a minute, there's something missing. I've been hiding myself. My wife has died. Something has shifted. I need to make myself known to the world. So he built the second tower, and I, he had help doing that one. He had, had it built. And then if you see right here, there's a, there's a stone. And it was brought to be put in the building, and he saw it, and he went, no, no, no. I need to carve that. That's special. So it sat there for a long time, and then he carved it. And this is one face of it. There are four faces. And this is, um, this is an alchemical, different alchemical thoughts. Time is a child playing like a child, playing a board game. The kingdom of the child. This is Telesphorus, who roams Telesphorus, this homunculus here, who roams through the dark regions of this cosmos and glows like a star out of the depths. He points the way to the gates of the sun and to the land of dreams. So you see he has four different parts. And um, there's a four-part mandala. The, top, the um, top is Saturn, if you can see it, Saturn. The bottom is Mars. The left is Sol there's Jupiter, or the sun. And the right is Venus and the moon. And so these are the alchemical sayings that he put around there that meant a lot to him. This is another side of the stone. Let's see, this is the rosarium. The rosarium, quote, is, here stands the mean, uncomely stone, tis very cheap in price. The more it is despised by fools, the more loved by the wise. So that's from the rosarium, which is also an alchemical text. And on the, on, um, on the back of it, yeah, okay, there's another show. And the, this third size says, it's an alchemical text also. I am an orphan alone. Never, nevertheless, I am found everywhere. I am an orphan alone, meaning I am the philosopher's stone. I am the true self. I am the rebirth. I am youth and old man at one and the same time. I have known neither father nor mother because I have had to be fetched out of the deep like a fish, or fell like a stone, white stone from heaven. In woods and mountains I roam, but I am hidden in the innermost soul. And getting back to Merlin, on the back side of the stone, which was left blank, what he wanted to, to carve, which he never did, was, um, was Le Cri de Merlin. The cry, the, cr the cry of Merlin, and that's Merlin, who was the druid, who was who had to depart from the world of men until he was found again. Okay. Any thoughts? I have a question. On the sure. list, uh, in the first image that you showed, I was. I was just trying to take it in, and it was interesting, the four quadrants, how the boundary between the bottom one and the upper of one to the right of it, of, above it, has a different boundary than the other. Yeah, it's more feminine, isn't it? More yeah, this, like, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Do you know what that, why that 
I've never, I haven't, it looks, it looks, it does look like a snake, and I haven't heard anything about that. Mm -hmm. that that's a good observation. Yeah, yeah. Anybody else? <coughs> yeah. Um, you know what language that one's written in? Um, I believe it's in Greek. Yeah. yeah. Any other thoughts or questions? Yeah. Uh, the imagination of, of what activates the imagination? Mm. Is, it, is it like a spring that would flow if it's not blocked? Or that sounds good to me. That's a wonderful image of it, isn't it? Okay. A spring yeah. bubbling up or shooting up or... And it seems to be other than the self, like beneath the self or beyond the self? Well, that's a good question. You know, the soul, I mean, something like the soul is so hard to define. It, he calls it the physiological body, the somatic unconscious, the physiological unconscious. Um, it's ephemeral, it's subtle body, it's the intermediate space between us and the, um, in that lunar consciousness that we get into where we can, where we can open to something that's speaking. Um, and let's go back to the, the soul. <coughs> now that we've, so, so here are some ideas, you know, some ideas about it. So from this, we can, we can define around it. It's hard to pinpoint, you know, scientifically, which is not, of course, what we want to do. We aren't going to get anywhere that way. Um, but this is, this is what we're looking for. It's the seed of all psychic, psychic suffering and dwelling in a place of all healing truth. He talks about how it invites us. It invites us with, with, to, to come into life, to come and live. Um, when, he, when Jung talks to the soul, eventually he says, you, you insisted that I live. I have to live to know you. I can't go off in a tower. I, I can't just pretend life isn't here. I can't not be responsible and not be a human being. It's really about what makes us human on the, on the most beautiful, deepest core. Yeah. I feel a lot of times it, it works this way for me, the imagination. A lot comes from God. Mm -hmm. Like when I'm composing music, especially sure. in, in the case with me, the imagination, I have synesthesia, so the music paints a picture mm -hmm. and tells a story. Mm -hmm. So, uh, like, I, I can look at the color of something, and I'll have a, a, it's the color of harmony. And so, but the imagination with synesthesia, what could be imagery for one could be different from another. But Absolutely. We all have a different way of entering into it. We can mm -hmm. have, some people are very visual, some people are very auditory. Or on the other. Do you think of Beethoven? He wrote his last, his ninth symphony being totally deaf. Where did that come from? It came from inside of himself. Yeah. It came from this connection to the unconscious. It, um, if somebody's a famous chef, where do you think their, their creativity comes from? Taste, smell. Smell takes us back to our earliest memories the quickest. I, I'm very kinesthetic. So I have, it's my, my images come after through the body. So it can be, it can be any modality. It could be like, like Jung, <coughs> stone. It can be writing, drawing, uh, weaving. You know, any, any modality can be a, a place to take a blank sheet of paper and just take Crayolas and just start playing with it without trying to make something happen without trying to create something. And you'd be surprised what comes out on the page. And then you look, and when it resonates, when, it, when you go, oh, wow, I feel more alive, you're connecting with soul, and you're connecting with the act of imagination. Did you have a thought? Yeah, um, I really like the second one, the seat of all psychic suffering and the dwelling place of all healing truth, which is so counter to our society today. Mm -hmm. You know, I've learned through my various forms of recovery that unless I'm willing to feel the pain, right. I can never get past it to get to the real healing. Mm -hmm. And yet our society is so completely contrary to that, which is really sad. Yeah, how many people are on antidepressants and, mm. and, and uh, benzodiazepines and, yeah. you know, and drugs, any, drugs, phenomenal. drugs yeah. alcohol, all that yeah. stuff. Yeah, yeah. 
Somebody here. Yeah. Joe. Yeah, I'm trying to uh, put some relationship to two terms uh, not present in these descriptions, and that is a spirit uh -huh. and uh, the self with the big S. Uh -huh. yeah. How do they relate? Is soul part of the big S, or is soul another variation of spirit, or is spirit another dimension, well, or level, a, other than the universe? That self. might be another lecture. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. anyway. Um, the whole, the whole um, definition of soul and spirit is very interesting. It's very complicated because it's changed its meaning through millennia. <coughs> and um, I didn't bring this piece by Jung where he really denotes, um, says what he thinks spirit is. But um, I didn't want to get into that talk at the moment because it's very complicated. And people feel diff think different things about it. I mean, these, these Soul and spirit in these terms are, you know, difficult to pin down, which they should be. Right? So we'll, we'll table that one. The biggest self would be our particular God image, our particular connection to the divine. So the soul would be in, would help us find that. It would lead us, it would lead us into suffering. It would guide us into places we haven't been where no man has been before. So, yeah. Okay, any other thoughts? Yeah, Daniel. Yeah, he's, um, like, I mean, it does feel like soul, if you say it's in the middle, it feels like it's the relationship. It's where relationship is happening, where there's some sort of, I don't know, the willingness of each side, to, you know, when they talk about transformation, each side is willing to surrender themselves to what is going to happen when they encounter each other. Um, but my question is, in terms conscious and unconscious, it's very interesting about, like, what is their... Can you speak up, Dan? What is their relationship? <coughs> like, it's, it does seem like you're saying the, uh, the unconscious wants a connection to the conscious. Mm -hmm. So why does the conscious not want a relationship to the unconscious? <coughs> maybe are the unconscious reasons for that kind of relationship. <laughs> well, that depends on the person, doesn't it? Why does the unconscious, why does the conscious not, not want a relationship with the unconscious? And, and it's not just a person, it seems the cultural um, mm -hmm. alienation yeah. that we were speaking of at the beginning. Yeah. That's the situation we're in. And, you know, if things are only, I believe that things exist in relationship, mm -hmm. so even though the conscious doesn't want is sort of avoiding, mm -hmm. it's still relating. Yeah. But it's relating in this other odd way. You know, well, why, we, yeah. if we sort of take these as models, the light, right and left hemisphere a little bit, yeah. I mean, these, you know, it's, um, we could say that our culture values these, correct? <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. And the soul wants these. Yeah. This is where the soul lives. Yeah. I mean, the soul lives in both, but, but this is what's missing, the right hemisphere. And it's, it's the soul, it's, um, I'm sure you can, we're, we live in the Happy Valley, <laughs> but if you go to other places, where, where do you think of the most soulless place you've ever been? Hollywood. Hollywood. Las Vegas. I've been to Las Vegas. The, 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 <laughs> my Jungian analyst training program did a, did a um, conference on money at Las Vegas. <laughs> and it was very interesting to be there with that topic, and many analysts wouldn't come. And, but it was very interesting to be in this yes. cauldron of money. Why do you think they wouldn't come? Because they, they didn't like Las Vegas. They thought it was soulless and superficial, but that was the whole country. I mean, it was talking about all these things. So, yeah. So, um, yeah, so if you think of, of a very soulless place, I'm sure every, I mean, that can be a little different for each person. Politics. Uh, politics can be very soulless. Very soulless. It can be. It can be yeah. soulful. I mean, I think, for me, the this, this most beautiful symbol that has come out of this whole crazy insanity is the day after Trump's inauguration and the Women's, Women's March. Yeah. It was phenomenal. Mm -hmm. And to me, that is our hope. The rise, this is exactly what we're talking about, the rise of the feminine. That's what Jung felt was missing. Yeah. You know, a, and, and also a, a healthy masculine. Again, it's not you know right. one. 
and this is not gender specific, okay? We're not talking about gender. We're talking about the masculine and feminine in all of us. Okay. It's so gotta be a balance. Yeah, it's gotta be a balance. You're right. And they complement to each other. Yeah, they should be. They should there should be a marriage. Yes. Hmm. Okay. So active imagination contains the very essence of psychological transformation. Transformation, the relationship between the conscious and the unconscious that leads to a new center and synthesis of the personality. That's the transcendent function. The new center, the, or the coming of the center. Okay. Yeah. The, the possibility of this, this injury or this, this where we are at now be the result of the left brain yes. dominating the right. Yes. We're spending time even tonight trying to explain something yeah. instead of doing word searches for what the whale would lead us to. There you go, the whale. And so we are here <laughs> participating in the injury. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good point. point. Good point. Not to be a bummer. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Not to be what? Not to be a bummer. Not to be a bummer. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Related to that, does, does the witness have anything to do with this, the kind of watching without reacting ability? Yeah, the soul invites us to open, okay? To just be open, to go into the pain, to go into the joy, to go into the image, to go into the dream. It invites us to interact. Okay. It's interesting that all this is already present in the myth of the fall. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's present in all myths, yeah, right? Yeah, but um, even in the sense of McGill Press the Eden came first, where there's all this connection, and the fall was the tree of knowledge, mm -hmm. seeking to know in order mm -hmm. to control, mm -hmm. instead of to uh, experience and accept and yeah. uh, and wonder and. Well, and as Neumann joy. said, maybe we had to go through that process. Exactly. Yeah. But because process. you said that before about how you didn't have suffering in the Garden of Eden. Mm -hmm. So you, maybe you did have to do that in order to get back to. Yeah, I, I did an internship with Outward Bound up in Northern Ontario, which is the most remote Outward Bound school in the world, and it's really remote, believe me. <laughs> and um, and I connected with this male um, Outward Bound instructor, and he said, you know, we didn't want to stay in the Garden of Eden. I mean, why would you want to stay in the Garden of Eden? You don't know anything. I mean, not not just left brain, but you, you aren't conscious. You aren't you aren't able to relate. You're just sort of in this paradise. You know, that's not suffering. That's just sort of blank, maybe, or just blissful. Or so, and the soul invites us into life. She invites <coughs> us down to earth. Okay. So. Okay. Could I just? I'm sorry, one, one more comment. Yeah. The, the man's sure. question about witness uh, mm -hmm. makes me feel uncomfortable. It seems to me the witness is an objective entity. It doesn't react. And, isn't, and the soul is subjective. It, mm -hmm. It's empathetic. But uh, the witness isn't just sees things as they are, like a mirror. Mm -hmm. So I, I think there is a difference. Uh, well, I think, I think there's I think there's a relationship. If I'm a good witness to myself, then I'm both consciously being with, and I'm const and I'm totally engaged at the same time. So I'm able to hold both places. That's why it's active imagination. Okay, I'm choosing. I am being with, but I don't go crazy. I don't lose my boundaries totally. I can come back. What's the difference between somebody who is uh, crazy or schizophrenic? And, and a mystic. One knows how to go into the unconscious, into these um, boundaryless places, into other dimensional realities, and come back. They know the threshold. They know how to go back and forth. Mm -hmm. Somebody who gets caught can't come back. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. <coughs> Let's see. Where am I? Okay. Okay, we come back to Peter Birkhauser. This is a wonderful, wonderful book. Does anybody know Peter Birkhauser? He was Swiss. He was a, a very, very famous, very well, highly respected and well-known graphic designer. And his graphic designs were very, he was known for a particular classical font. 
talk about left brain. You know, he was very meticulous, very, and he w he did um, graphic design for companies and banks and all over the world. And he was very, he did this for many, many, many years. This was his um, career. And uh, he was brilliant. And in uh, 1934, he um, married a woman, I, um, and she was very interested and very knew a lot about Jung, and that's where he began to learn about Jung. In 1942, he had this dream, in which he could not paint till 1975. It was so it was so intense for him. And this dream, so the dream is he and his wife. That's his wife, his anima, his feminine guide. Yeah, they're going up to into into a into a tower, a square tower. At the top, they're going to go to analysis. He hadn't even been in analysis yet. And they come into the tower, and this creature comes down. And it's a fish insect kind of a creature that, that's depicted here. And he's terrified in the dream. And his wife is a good witness. She just she just is there with the creature. She's not afraid of it. And the creature blows this blue light onto her. And then the creature comes so close to her, it's like the creature, he says in the dream, it's like the creature kissed her. And then the creature goes away and they start going up. And the wife has no problem getting up. Because the first floor, the second floor, and Peter, Bierkhauser, he just, he, all kinds of things happen to him. <laughs> he has to jump over something, and he, uh, an abyss, and he has to, the <coughs> stairs fall, and all kinds of stuff, and he barely can get up. When he gets to the top, he, suddenly this huge eye appears to him, the eye of God, and he just is terrified. I mean, I think I'd be terrified if I saw the eye of whatever God is in my dream. So, and like I said, he was so, this was such an intense dream, and this started him on his journey. I mean, it was a wake-up call. It was, you are, you need to come back to your soul. You need to come back to the unconscious. And the second, and the, the, the painting we saw at the beginning, The Cloven Man, The World's Wound, was done in 1949, and then he began to do other ones. And, what I'm, and there are a number of paintings, and he worked with von Franz, Marie-Louise von Franz, from about 1942, when he had this dream, till the end of his life, till about 1975. And I'm going to show you some um, pictures, some paintings that particularly focus on the feminine. I couldn't find them all online, but I'll show you as many as I could find. So here, it's called The Inward Gaze, 1954. And this is his feminine soul, his feminine side who's sort of not very present. She's sort of caught in the, in the field, the, the uh, power of the great dark mother. I have no idea what his mother complex was like. But, and here's Peter Birkhauser. This is, a, here, this is a woman caught in the claw, a naked woman in the claw of the great mother, of the dark. Huh? I know. I don't know. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. I never. I didn't read anything about a penis in that picture. But. Okay. So that's one of his first paintings, dreams, and paintings of his feminine. And this Peter, the Anima Crown of Light, 1964. And Sri Aurobindo says, if there is to be a future, it will wear a crown of feminine design. That was lovely to go with this picture, the crown of life, the crown. And so this was one of his early connections with the feminine. Then uh, in 1959, he had this dream of this fish, and you see the masculine and the feminine are, are, are um, having a conjunctio in the fish, in the fish is the, the uh, an animal that swims in the unconscious, deep in the unconscious swims. And he says of this, of this, that um, this in this dream and image, that he is, there is a fertilization that's being done by the unconscious, a fertilization 
by the unconscious to him. This is the white lady. This was this is a harbinger of death. This happened two weeks before his wife died. So she's a she's a figure of wisdom, of death, of of um, she can see in the dark. And and it, it I couldn't find a good image of it. She's holding a chalice in her hand, a big cup in her hands, and offering it to him. So she's offering him the cup, which is a very feminine symbol to drink from. Remember the the cloven man? This is in 1975. This is he finally had another image dream of it, and the the wound is being healed <coughs> with the red blood. The wound is being healed finally in him, and this is called dialogue. Dialogue where this the words and the, the um, is coming out of his mouth. This is Isis. And he really got very interested in the goddess Isis. And the goddess Isis says, I give you intoxication each day, joy without heartache. I give you the love of the gods. I pour love for you. So this is the aspect of Isis that he was, that came through for him when he drew this and focused on it. So each of these paintings was a whole process for him. Each of the dreams and the paintings brought him to a new place inside of himself, a connection, reconnection with his soul, a reconnection with his life. And of course, he stopped being a graphic artist after a little while, and he felt like he needed to focus on his journey. Yes? What were Jung's, what were Peter's for this matters, uh, modalities of, I guess, cultivation of um, Of doing this? Yes. Um, Basically, he would have dreams, and then he would he would allow himself to paint the dreams. There are many, many paintings, and but when he, the painting was a further elaboration of the dream for him. So he would sit down and he would start painting, and things would come out in the paintings that would help him understand the dream. So earlier you were saying one of Hume's biggest recommendations was to bring forth the feminine. That's correct. Bring, yeah, bring forth the unconscious. Okay. Connect with the the soul. What were some of his, uh, I guess, methods you mentioned the briefly uh, play and things like that? Well, this is play for him. This would be his play. Remember, play can be very serious. Yeah, well, no, I, I was yeah. wanted, to, wanted to, I guess, uh, understand more of the methods. Yeah. To get in touch with him. That's what, that's yeah, what so he would sit down after having a dream, usually a dream, sometimes an uh, experience or something, and he would sit down and start to paint. That was his method. So he would allow himself to paint, not not in a design graphic kind of way, but just allow the the painting to happen and see what came out in relationship to the dream. So that was his method. So it seems like femininity, I guess, wants to naturally express, and it's just the removal of those things that don't yeah, especially. Yeah, yeah, and of course, masculine wants to express too, right? Yes. But but he he um, but he had that left brain side very. So he needed to develop the right, the, the, the soul right brain aspect. And this was his way of doing it, was to really meditate with the dreams through the art. Okay, yeah. Excuse me, can you speak up? Um, can you repeat yeah. that question? Can, the, um, does the right and left brain have any have anything to do with the functions of <coughs> the judging and perceiving functions in typology? Yeah, I would think. Yeah, the, the judging would be more left 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 hemisphere activities. And again, we aren't. I'm not just. I'm not just talking brain thing, brain research, because that's a little narrow for me. But yes, that kind of perceiving and and connecting with data and perceiving would be more of a right hemisphere kind of a function. It, it's intuitive, it's perceptive, it's nonverbal, it's um, into process, not into facts, right? Not into judging, it's into allowing to happen. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. You know, there's a lot here. There's a lot to think about. There's a lot to ponder. Okay.
This was one of his last paintings. He died in 1976. So this is the, the uh, butterfly bird. And I'm not going to say a lot about this because I have other things. But we see here a woman, and she's a, uh, there's a lot of Jewish tradition. This belt is, is a Jewish traditional thing. And, um, and then she's giving birth to the butterfly. And the butterfly, it's interesting because some of his early paintings, which were still when he was a graphic artist, were about insects. He loved to paint very intricate, detailed animals. And he liked to paint dead things, moths. And there's a beautiful painting of a moth. But here's the butterfly coming alive. And the butterfly is a symbol of the psyche. And this is his last painting, the anima. And it's an unfinished painting. It was done a couple weeks before he died. So this was his last, his last statement on this, on this, in this plane. Did he know anima. he was dying? Well, I don't know. I don't know. I'm not sure. Yeah. Interesting thing. This book was, uh, there was an earlier book that didn't have a lot of information. This book has commentary by von Franz, his analyst, and also his daughter, who went back and put all this together and did this beautiful book with many pictures. <coughs> it's the Windows into Eternities. This is the name of the book. It's amazing painting. Was he an analysis this whole time? Yes. With von Franz? With von Franz. Okay. All right. So, yes. Um, yeah. Going back to the question about methods of mm -hmm. doing active imagination, yeah. you said at the beginning you don't have to paint. Mm -hmm. But you do have to take the image and stay with it, not yeah. associate it as a let, let me define image. Image isn't just visual. Image can be any medium. Okay, it can be a feel, an emotional feeling, an energetic experience. It's, it's. I think that's confusing in Jung. Uh, when I first started doing my thesis on active imagination, I, um, I started reading a lot of stuff from Zurich. A lot of people, and there wasn't a lot when I did my thesis. There's a lot more now, and. For Jung, image meant any any sense, any medium. Okay. So even if it were a smell, or a yes, smell. like a like a chef, that would be that could take him into a very amazing, creative, psychological, transformative space. But if one were not going to paint, mm -hmm. yeah, you don't have to paint. What would other things? Well, Jung paint? built a building. Okay. Jung carved a stone. Mm -hmm. Jung wrote. His experiences in the, in the, that he went through. Um, he did paint. His paintings are amazing. I'll just show you one. This is the unconscious. We, we talked about the spring. This is the unconscious just bursting forth. This is, um, what's her, which one is this? This is Sapientia um, uh, in the Jewish temple. These are his paintings after he had these experiences that he put in the Red Book later. This is the serpent. So each one of these paintings for him would be an act of imagination. He didn't necessarily, I'm not sure, it depends on the painting, he didn't necessarily start out to paint the serpent, but it might have appeared as he started to paint. And the thing about active imagination, again, is you become alive, something resonates, something starts moving you, something starts coming up that you that has not come up before. Okay? But my question is, if we're not going to paint, Right. I'll, I'll get into some other examples. Okay. Yeah. So he carved a stone. He, he said, writing and painting isn't enough. So he built a building. He did, did, did a stone. People weave music. You do music. People dance. Yeah, dance. Any any form. Can you do it just internally? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. You can just have an experience, and then you might want to write it down so you remember it. But yeah, you can just, me it's a meditation. It's a very um, gentle meditation. You don't focus. You just try to open to whatever it is. And then it can come out in any form. I go through movement a lot. Yeah. You can have dialogue. Yeah, you can have dialogue. With an element of a dream, a conversation with, right. uh, 
it is a dialogue with the unconscious, so you can have a dream figure and you can talk to it. Mm -hmm. And if it responds, not just, I think this is what it's saying, if it actually responds, you go, oh, hello, you're here, <laughs> tell me. So that, that the element of, of novelty and a little bit, and resonance and a little bit of a surprise or a little bit of a, of a soulfulness is what we're looking for, not just thinking. It's not about thinking, just, yeah. Is it, um, the, the phrase often comes up, um, stream of consciousness, mm -hmm. would that be something that related yeah, in some way? Yeah, it would be, it would be a, a, a concentrated, perhaps, stream of consciousness that, that is, is focusing on something coming up from the unconscious, right? Yes? Um, <coughs> Carol Anthony, who does a lot of work with AG, uh -huh. has a method where you, um, meditation is where you just sit and you you visualize that you're sitting in a movie theater before the screen is open up mm -hmm. and then you wait for whatever's coming up. Yeah. So it's that could be a way. An active way. And then but then it seems like what Jung is saying is is that you stick with that, whatever comes up and work with that for Yeah. And until, just wait for the next movie to come up. Right. You don't just go, Oh, okay, that was yeah, fun. Let's time. go to the next one, next one. No, no. You really stay with it until until it feels finished. Until it's um, his his experiences would happen randomly. You know, he would just get a feeling. Oh, I've got to focus. This he would just sit down and, and feel and go inside. And then his his um, like when he talked to love, when he talked to the soul, he just sat there and he started talking to the soul. Right, and then he wrote it down. Yeah. <coughs> Hold on. Let me just get back to where I'm supposed to be. Okay. Yes, Chris. Do you think when he was down by the lake messing around with the, the little stones there, mm -hmm. do you think that was an act of imagination? Yes. Okay. So yes. He just kind of so had, he was playing. He was, just he was allowing his yeah. fantasy yeah. to, to, he was following his fantasy. He was, he was going, oh, that stone. Oh, that pebble. Oh, that. Oh, where's it go? It goes here. It goes here. It goes here. And his village appeared, yeah. and his memories started happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, Carol. I always have this um, discomfort. Mm -hmm. I feel that you that the language uh, is that is in response to a narrowing that that evolutionary-wise, we began to narr narrow and expand, the ra narrow into the rational mind and expand. Uh -huh. But at the same time, we're much more than that. Yeah. And it seemed to me that that when, in then fighting, trying to work back against that narrowing, we I'm, this is, I'm here to say this, because it's always trouble. Mm -hmm. uh, Jung and others develop a language trying to work back, to, you see, against the narrowing. Uh -huh. But in fact, somehow I often just feel uncomfortable, like there are actually very m multiple possibilities sure. of being human. Mm -hmm. uh, that are, in a way, that's why people have trouble. We say, well, that's the unconscious, well, that's the unconscious, well, that's the unconscious. <laughs> you know, for me, there's, uh, we're multiple. There's a lot more to us going on than this narrowing that happens. Right. So that we could develop it. Mm -hmm. And so that, to me, is sometimes why I have trouble with the language. Mm -hmm. I, I think I'd piggyback on that and say that, and I think somebody tried to say this before, that the whole idea of trying to language it at all is already taking us a step removed from what it is. Right. But, well, but it, okay. that's what troubles yeah. me. There's this it, and I well, think the it is, is multiple. Yeah, yeah. I, I hear what you're fine. saying. But whatever it is, I mean, yes, that it, we it, lost. It, it, it definitely involves a lot of ambiguity because it is something bigger than I, we just use it to say that there is no language for it. Yeah, okay, so, that's, I mean, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, absolutely. How, how do you language it? I mean, this was Jung's way of languaging it. And, and I don't, it's hard, 
and uh, it is hard to stay fluid when you start conceptualizing anything, correct? Right. Is that, okay. you know, but how else do you begin to talk about it together? That's a, that's a, it's a problem. Yeah. And uh, so as an analyst or as somebody working with this, you have to stay fluid. I mean, when I'm sitting with somebody, I don't necessarily use all these terms. I'm, I'm sitting with them doing the process. I don't care about the terms. Somebody comes in and says, oh, that's my anima. Oh, really? What is that? Right, right. You know, let's not get stuck in this concept of anima or animus or whatever. Let's, let's work with it. Right. Language is, yeah, it, it can be problematic. Okay, let's go on because I have to, get, have to go on. Okay. Um, okay, where am I? Da, 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 da. Okay. This is a sand tray, which is another form that we can use. Does anybody <coughs> know about sand tray? Yeah. And this is a, a small sand tray of, of somebody who was struggling with inner, inner dark connections and pain and fear. And, but you have the woman, this beautiful woman with the baby. With the, with the infant. So here's the, the dark forces and this beautiful container. Which And we do need a container. We can't just go, okay, I'll just walk into anything and allow anything to happen. We do need to be able to know the threshold and go into the process and come out. And understand it and go into the process and come out. Okay, so on that note, I'm going to show you, let's see if I can do this. A movie. This is done at the Jung Center in Houston, where I where I taught for 25 years. And the woman is Carolyn Fay, who was uh, did a lot with movement and sand tray and art. And I think it speaks for itself. Let's see if it comes up. was above, looking down on a scene. I saw a small island surrounded by a sea, limitless in all directions. The sea was gray, no white caps, but moving slowly and rather ominously, I felt. There was a tiny beach on the left with two bodies lying on it, one male and one female. They lay side by side in opposite directions. They were dead, even though they looked alive. Their bodies were covered from the chin of one to the chin of the other with a large American flag in vibrant red, white, and blue. The rest of the island was entirely covered with bright green growing grass. I had this dream during the Persian Gulf War and even though I've never dreamed it again, it contains so much meaning for me that it's been resurfacing ever since, especially now that I'm on the threshold of the final stage of my life. Of the collective unconscious, 
the unconscious of all the people of the world. The island that has risen up out of the ocean can represent a person as an individual. Most significantly for me, this dream represents what's happening for myself. The gray, ominous ocean seemed to contain many dire things that I need to work through. And the change in me that this image seems to indicate is a passage from a lifestyle dictated by outer authority to one of growth for my inner self. I have followed in the footsteps of my family and my late husband Ernie for years. I most often work with people for an hour a week, but there's some clients I see from out of town, like Tinker. With these clients, whom I see every month or so, we often work for a full day or maybe longer. I like working with someone for as long as there's material to work with rather than having to stop when an hour is up. Feel the sand, see how it feels. Today we're working with sand play, which is another great way of contacting the unconscious. I often do this with people who come to work with me for the first time, who are hesitant about getting up and being seen moving around. Playing in the sand, a person may feel less on the spot and less aware of what they might be revealing to me. And also it's very helpful, you know, if someone's stuck or blocked or an image seems very mysterious to them. The sand play experience is wonderful because it's in 3D. You can look down at this tray and it's like you're looking at a metaphor of your whole life right now. The room is filled with little figurines that have been categorized. The person will look around the room and pick whatever little figures seem to call out to them. Sand tray figures and the sand in the tray are all concrete. They can be handled, placed, and they stay put. Whereas movements are ephemeral, it comes and goes. Many of the people I've worked with use the sand like a blank sheet of paper and just put the figures on top of it. But Tinker really worked the sand a lot before she even looked at the shelves. Oh, I wish I could really put my feet in here. And my hands, I think, really are my feet. <laughs> I guess no matter who does the sand tray, you put the figures in it and it portrays your life as it is right now. So if you're struggling with something in your life, that's what you'll see. If you're on the threshold of a new stage in life, as Tinker is, you'll see the apprehension and the excitement of change. But she's been saying that she felt she was on the verge of something new in her life. In her outer world, she has come down here and rented a little apartment. She's gonna come and spend half a week for the whole fall semester, take courses, work here with me. This is very different, you know. She's never done anything like this before. You can put all those in? I might. <laughs> I don't know what just hit me. <laughs> what would happen? It's like, yes. So they'd receive. 
at one point she took this ugly old oyster shell and she put it to one side. And I said to her, what is this you're rejecting? This was one of the few times in this session that I asked her a direct question. And it may have made her stop and think about the relevance of this shell to her life because later she took it back and she even put it in the center. We need a pearl, don't we? No, how about a shell with a, with a rose petal in it? Is it okay if I bury all these things? You can get any new ones. We've got to take care of the things. After staring at it for a while, she began to make a counterclockwise spiral down the mound. Just like it had been for Mary with her drawing, this counterclockwise movement represented an unconscious movement inward. As she continued to do this spiraling down, more and more of the treasures were revealed. And this is how you live the spiral. As you go along in life, more and more of yourself is revealed. <laughs> I think I have to leave it all covered. Can you cover it back up? I'm going to cover it back up. I, I think it just has to be covered, except maybe this one. I have two things. <laughs> I have two things I really want to keep on top. I think the rest of it has to stay hidden for a while. It's not ready. It's cooking. It's in the oven. Oh, this really does look like a breast now. <laughs> I didn't realize what I was doing until it submitted. Yeah, I mean, it, it kind of looks like a breast, but it also feels like, yes, a belly. But ah, yes. <laughs> yes. It reminds me also of kind of those burial mounds, so it's both kind of death and life. Um, it's kind of like burying a bunch of things, and then also containers of a lot of new. Mm -hmm. You go through a death and a rebirth many, many times as you go through life. Sometimes they're small, sometimes they're enormous, where you change from one level of consciousness to another. Why don't we put everybody in here? There were other things that she picked out that she added at this point. She put a snake around the bottom, which is a wonderful metaphor for death and rebirth because it sheds its skin. And she put two open shells on the side and a starfish at the north. And then an owl sitting on one corner looking at it all. <laughs> What's he what? doing? Uh -huh, he's watching the whole process. That's the wise old man. Mm -hmm. This owl, I feel, is the beginning of an inner witness that is developing in Tinker. You know, part of the goal in therapy is for the client to not need the therapist anymore. And in order for that to happen, they must develop their own inner witness so they'll be able to do this work on their own. Well, goodbye, everybody. <laughs> I'm taking you with me inside. <laughs> After we leave the sand tray, we go into the studio and imagine that the studio is the sand tray, just life-size. And all the figures that the person has put in the sand tray then are, are human or life-size. They can imagine them bigger than they are, really. See how they move and how they feel and live out the story, move out the story.
Now, somewhere in it all, I decided to cover them up again because I had done that in the sand tray. So I decided I'd put the sand over them and cover them up. But the minute I did, it was like, don't cover over yourself anymore. Don't hide it any longer. And it just didn't feel good at all. You know, I, can, I think the reason I want to cover it up is almost like too much. It's like, it, that is just too much. To... What you did with it in the sand tray was interesting because you had the bowl and it was a big pile of treasure, mm -hmm. but you took one at a time. So that's the way I can deal with it, one at a time. Thank you for saying that. That's how. I guess I kind of do all or nothing, don't I? <laughs> all of it or none of it. <laughs> Uh, uh, one at a time. <laughs> That'll be my, <laughs> my new theme. Having this this baby, you know, I mean, it's 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 just a beautiful symbol of of this new place she is in her life. Uh, Jung is he believes so in in the death and rebirth experience, and that we talked about earlier. You. She's, she's a, she actually, she died. This is where I used to teach in Houston. And she's created the School of Expressive Arts down there. Okay, people will do anything, no matter how absurd, in order to avoid facing their own souls. Like, like, being too busy all the time. Like, anybody? Addictions. What? Addictions. Addictions, yes. Um, reading. Mem he says, memorizing, um, wrote memorization of spiritual text, of, you know, learning Jung's language, <coughs> learning Jung's terms, and going, okay, I know what the anima is. What else? How else do we avoid our own soul? Intellectual and academic pursuits. Intellectual and academic pursuits only, right? Yes? Not enough solitude. Not enough solitude. Not just and Jung said, there was a guy who came and said, but, uh, but I, sit alone, I sit at the piano, and I, and I sit at the piano and play. And he said, well, but you're not just letting it happen. You're playing something, right? But giving, giving space. <coughs> yeah. Anything else? How, do, how else do we avoid our own souls? Doing anything just by rote. Yeah. You know, just over and over and over with no, no connection. No resonance. She was resonating with that sand tray, wasn't she? She threw, put out all the shells and she started to cry. It resonated. It spoke to her. She didn't know what it meant. But, oh, there's something happening here. Okay. <coughs> and not have the slightest faith that anything useful could come out of their own souls. It is rewarding to watch patiently the silent happenings in the soul. And the most and best happens when it is not regulated from the outside and from above. I have such great respect for what happens in the human soul that I would be afraid of disturbing and distorting the silent operations of nature by clumsy interference. Okay? Okay, I'm going to go on to the last piece here, which, um, is it, has, has anybody seen the, the Beasts of the Southern Wild, the film? Okay, this is, I keep, I thought, well, I've shown this before, but it's so beautiful. It's such a beautiful piece. So, um, The Beast of the Southern, the, the Southern Wild is a film, it was actually made, I believe, after Katrina, but it, it's kind of a Katrina in reverse. Um, the, the, these very poor people live in what's called the bathtub, which is on the other side of the levee, outside of, say, New Orleans or something. So they live in this lowland, um, wetlands place, and they're very poor, and they have a community, and so it's about them, and a, and a hurricane comes. And then they, their sort of community is destroyed and they have to rebuild. And this is a little girl called Hush Puppy. Her nickname is Hush Puppy. And this is her act of imagination, which transforms and helps her grow up. Okay? So in the beginning, she's, um, her teacher has told her about the Oracs, 
which is an ancient prehistoric um, beast from, from the caveman days. And this, this beast means is a beast of survival. It knows how to survive. It, it, you'll see. <laughs> and um, she said, these strong animals got no mercy. They're the type of animals that eat their mommies and daddies. So th that's how strong these animals are. And she needs a lot of strength. Her father is alcoholic, and her mother dies when she's very young. And so this is her journey. It's, it's, a, it's a journey. And here we, she and three girls go off to find, on a, on a sort of a walkabout, to find, to discover something. And they come to the bay, and they go in. They swim with a little ring of uh, life preserver thing. And this boat picks them up. Um, and uh, the captain, who's kind of a salty guy, he, so she, sa she says to him, which way are we going? He says, it don't matter, baby. <laughs> this boat will take you exactly where you need to be. <laughs> so, and so they end up at a brothel, the Elysian Fields brothel. <laughs> That's an interesting name for it. And she ends up with the cook. She goes into the kitchen, which is which is a wonderful symbol of al alchemy, the, the place of transformation. The cook makes her dinner, and then there's this beautiful music, and the cook is holding her, and she's dancing. She's mm. dancing with her, you know. And this little girl just leans into this woman, and probably for the first time in her life, she's really mothered. Mm. Okay. So this is. as a baby. Alright, fast so read some air. So she's with the cook. I need a um...
different kind of. I gotta take care of mine. all goes quiet behind my eyes. I see everything that made me flying around in invisible pieces. When I look too hard, it goes away. But when it all goes quiet, I see they're right here. I see that I'm a little piece, a 
of a big, big universe. And that makes things right. When I die, the scientists of the future, they're gonna find it all. They go. So, without thinking about it and analyzing it, anybody have a feeling that came up? I get curious. Any, any other feeling? Anybody else? Wonder. Wonder. Yeah. Awe. Awe. Okay. I love that line. That made me cry when I first saw the film when she faces the beast face to face. And the first thing she says is, you're my friend, kind of. Yeah. And it just says everything. And they bow to her. Yeah. It's very good. Yeah. Anybody else feeling anything that resonated? It's a lot of courage and bravery. Okay, well, let's not analyze it. What feeling? What does that make you feel? Love. Love. Okay. Proud. Love. Proud. Okay. Moved. Moved. So moved. Anybody else? It's pointing. Pointing, yeah. Awe. Reverence. Awe. Reverence. Yeah. Anybody else? Courage. The courage. It's like a sense of her. Like, how do you describe a feeling when you witness a transformation mm. and initiation? Mm -hmm. It's so hard to yeah. describe. Yeah, yeah, hard to describe. And, uh, yeah, she turns around and faces something, doesn't she? Like we turn around and face things. If we can face it, if we can face it. I had a face feeling our my heart was expanding. What? I had a feeling my heart was mm -hmm. expanding. Your heart was expanding. Yeah. Okay, okay. So what was the title of the movie again? Um, Beasts of the Southern Wild. Okay. Anne Baring, at the, um, in her book, um, well actually this was in a, um, a YouTube lecture that I saw, she's amazing, look her up, she has some wonderful lectures. She says, this path that we're on, towards the feminine, towards the soul, back to the unconscious, or evolutionary impulse is, is working a profound alchemy beneath the surface of our culture, drawing men and women together to participate in a process of transformation that is slowly manifesting as a new consciousness which recognizes the interconnection and the interdependence of all aspects of life, their essential but hidden oneness. And this is what I felt when I, when I participated in the Women's March, the day I made the inauguration, yeah. and when it happened again. And when I see, as, I mean, that, that dream and image that Carolyn Fay did of the Persian Gulf, I mean, is that relevant or not? It's just, you know, it keeps coming up. The archetypal issue of the old needing to die, the patriarchy, you know, the, the flag and the people. These are, this is a symbol of our country that wants to dominate everything. So when, she, when she had solved it, when she drew the flag. So, so, um, and back to Einstein. Uh, I just heard on the radio a couple days ago that Jean Sharp, who is a very um, highly respected and well-known activist in, non, in the nonviolent resistance uh, work, he was given the Einstein Award for his work. And he just died a couple days ago. And uh, Einstein was quite an amazing man. At the end, he became very political. He was really against the, the bomb. And Einstein says, the religion of the future is a cosmic religion. Quote, it should be based on a religious sense arising from the experience of all things, material and spiritual, as a meaningful entity. So there you have the world soul needing to come back in and be recognized and be lived and to unite us all. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.